I love the smell of that incense, but <coughs> it's pretty strong, I've got to say. Um, so, do you know, I don't know, well, let's see who knows this. You know Coca-Cola, right? Do you know there's supposed to be a, a secret recipe for Coca-Cola that only, uh, apparently, like four or five people in the whole world know? I don't know if this is true or not, but like, let's, let's imagine it is. Um, so, apparently, there are four or five men or women who know the true recipe to Coke because they don't want Pepsi to find out. And judging by the taste of a Pepsi I had last week, they haven't found out. <laughs> now, apparently, these four or five men and women can never get on the same plane together. Um, they, they're always, you know, they're, they're kept guarded. Yeah, I know, it's ridiculous, right? They're kept guarded, and uh, they have the recipe in a suitcase or, so, or a briefcase or something like that. And, uh, and they hold on to the secret of the great taste of Coke. And that's why Coca-Cola is still pretty awesome today, unless you drink Coke Zero or Diet Coke, and then it's not so great. But, you know, the, the Coke that we know is still, is still brilliant. You know, but everyone wants to know the secret, but we kind of don't at the same time, do you know? It's kind of kind of mysterious. Now, I say that because uh, last week, uh, I think it was after one of the masses, I think, um, someone said to, to, to me, uh, Father James, uh, so how do, you, how do you prepare your homilies? I really like your homilies. I'm not buttering myself up, but like, how do you prepare your homilies? What, what's the process? And uh, I thought, if they actually knew, knew the truth, it would be far, far, far less impressive than if I just kept it secret. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a little insight, do you know, because I think often people, like, you know when you look at a, a work of art or something, you imagine that the artist is just there all the time going, and then all these great thoughts are coming to them. Uh, Caravaggio is my favourite artist, and uh, apart from being a brilliant painter, he was an adulterer, um, got into drunken fights all the time, ended up his life as a tramp, and as a murderer, you know? Still a brilliant artist. So anyway, I'll give you a little insight into what homily preparation consists of for me. So, I get up, I walk the streets for a little while, this is true, with the readings in my hand, turn it over in my head, and then I sit in Starbucks for about eight hours a week, and I stare into the distance like this. And at somewhere along the process, a homily appears. I can't write it down, because I'm, I'm not a very good writer, but at some point, something kind of falls from the clouds, and I make really great friends at Starbucks. I've probably kept Starbucks around the corner afloat just by my business. I've sorted out the marriages of the people behind the desk in the process. Because when I prepare something, I don't like to be alone, you know? And because when I'm alone, I can't think. But when I'm surrounded by people who aren't paying any attention to me, then I can think. And so goes a part. I'm not going to let you know the secret source, because then, you know, then we'd all be doing it. But apart from, you know, that, that's, that's it. There's nothing special to it at all. There's nothing special to about most of my life, just, just as, and I don't want to don't want to blow anyone's bubble, there's must, nothing special about most of your lives either. doesn't mean you're not special, does it? doesn't mean you're not special at all because you're loved. In today's Gospel, James and John have an impression of Jesus. All the disciples have an impression of Jesus, you know, which Jesus actually serves to break down bit by bit throughout his ministry. They get into a place where they can actually begin to understand him. Because today, they think, well, you know, Jesus is, is going to be, and therefore must be already, an all-powerful king. He's just waiting to show his hand. He's just waiting to reveal himself to the world as this all-powerful king who's going to rule all. He will, but not in the way that they think. So they say to him, they say, Jesus, we want you to do us, we want you to do us a favor. We think we know, we think we know the secret. We think we know what you've got planned. Peter, a couple of chapters ago, he blew it. But we're your boys. So when it all happens, can we sit at your right and your left? And Jesus, as usual, you can imagine him. Like, I think Jesus must have sighed most of the time. You hear it a few times, you're just like, you don't know what you're asking, do you? You see, I think, and I don't know, I think to be Jesus, to be fully divine, and therefore to know what it is to be fully human, not like Adam, but like you and me, means Jesus carries around not this sinless, like this kind of sinlessness mental state. He knows everything about you and me. 
all of our weakness, all of our sinfulness, all of our hatred, everything, and he bears it. He carries it in his mind all the time. I think that's what it means to be fully human, as Jesus was fully human. Not free from sin, he never committed sin, but rather carrying the burden in his mind of all our weakness, of all our ego, of all our ambition, of all our inflatedness. And in spite of all that, to choose the path of a servant. That's the miracle of Jesus' humanity. He is sinless, while at the same time being all of my, your, and your sin at the same time. All of it. He knows all of it. And he knows James and John. And knowing all of it, not just in his head, but rather carrying it in his body, being burdened by it constantly, by being burdened by it constantly, he proposes a different path. He proposes a solution to this way of life, this mentality of James and John that he proposes to you and me. And that is the path of a slave, the path of a servant. It runs so counter to the logic of humanity because we measure the success of our lives so often by the things, the materials, and the relationships that we accumulate around us. And we associate with that with success and God's blessing. And Jesus says, no, all of these things with your heart and with your mind, because I know it, because I carry it, because I possess it, though I don't act upon it, all of that is the road to perdition. You may accumulate in this life, but in the next life it will be gone. And the next life with everything that the world can give isn't worth living. And he knows it. He knows it from his experience as the Son of God, and he knows it because he bears every person's individual burden of sin. He knows it all. How often it says in the Gospel, doesn't it, Jesus knew what was in the heart of man. Now we could say, well, that just came down to him as kind of like a a bit of information from above, like, I don't know, like downloading, um, I don't know, an app from a satellite somewhere up in heaven. Or it could come from lived experience. Because to be fully human, to share our humanity means to know what it is to be you and me. And in the face of that, Jesus doesn't propose worldly success. He chooses the position of a servant to place ourselves at the bottom of things so that we may understand ourselves and in understanding ourselves, all the depth of goodness and the depth of evil, we may properly serve our brothers and sisters. We may know what their needs are because we can identify them with our own and respond with love. That's what Jesus did. He chose the place of a servant, knowing our condition. He gave up his life for us, knowing our condition, knowing that we are helpless, ultimately, to become the kind of creature God intends us to be. He steps with our humanity into that space. And having done that, invites us to do the same. He is the pioneer, as Hebrews says, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He journeys with my heart, with all its weaknesses, with all the secrets I'll never tell you, and the secrets you'll never tell me. He journeys with my heart to the cross. And that heart is now to the cross, in a love that I don't possess, that I'm not capable of, but by his power nonetheless is nailed there and made perfect through a slow, slow process of betrayal, of sin, of forgiveness and redemption. And we get a chance to live this life and renew this life each and every single day. Because I can guarantee you at the end of each and every single day, if you're anything like me, and you are, because you're all sinners, like me, you will have failed. But you will have learned as well. And that's the basis for a new beginning. If we see each day as a beginning from zero, that's not bad. That's good. Because it's zero with the wisdom of yesterday's accumulation, of yesterday's sin, of yesterday's successes, of its triumphs and its failures. We start from the bottom again, as Jesus did, each and every day in his life on earth, and as he does with us now. We worship a a Jesus who is crucified and risen. He's still crucified for us. He continues to be the perfect sacrifice to take our sins away because that's what we celebrate at Mass. But at the Mass, we also have the benefit and the joy of knowing that through this crucifixion, 
by placing ourselves at the foot of the cross, by occupying the position of slave for our brothers and sisters, putting all our sins down there, there is the promise of resurrection. Why? Because a human being, like us, has already done it. And it's in that we place our hope. Amen.